We are The God Culture, a group of independent researchers with no affiliation to any denomination nor organization whatsoever. We read the word and we test it as 1 Thessalonians 5.21 tells us, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. We do not intend to be confrontational. But to compare what the Bible really says versus the traditions of men, which at times can be confrontational. See, Jesus himself rebuked the Pharisees. He said, full well you reject the commandment of God, and we're going to do so in this video, that ye may keep your own tradition, Mark 7, 9. What tradition did the Pharisees follow? Well, they put it in writing eventually, their oral traditions, in writing now are called the Talmud, the Mishnah at first, and this is their document, not the Torah. They do not teach Torah. In fact, when they do teach Torah, they turn the commandments on their ear, period. Now, this is our journey through the Word, and we are restoring the name of God in our worship, and that name is Yahuwah and not Jehovah or Yehovah. We've pretty much already proven that, but we promised a video from a modern Pharisee in which we would respond, and here it is. We are about to review an interview by Dr. Michael Rood on his program, A Rood Awakening, who used to pronounce the name of God Yahweh, which is getting fairly close for all of his ministry, but now he has changed this to Yehovah based on this new so-called research from Nehemiah Gordon. That's how he pronounces his name. A Hebrew University scholar in whom many of his colleagues do not agree. Let's be clear. This is new doctrine and it does not fit anything in scripture nor anything ever found in antiquity. Only modern things can he show you to try to make his case. And when you see him make his case, you can see exactly just how ridiculous it is. Don't worry. He'll let you know your place, though. And he'll disseminate his pearls of knowledge. Well, just a few crumbs for us goyim. So we can know how to pronounce the name of God, which his people erased from Scripture and don't pronounce. In fact, that is their practice, to not pronounce it, yet he's supposed to teach us how to pronounce it. Yes, who better to teach us than those who suppress the knowledge in the first place, of course, because they would never have an agenda. Yes, that's sarcasm. And you will always get a good dose of that here, because that is who we are. Because as we continue to test things, much of scholarship, especially regarding biblical geography, and even here as we get into supposed linguists who make rather grotesque, frankly, assertions, and they don't even bother to support these conclusions that they draw. Don't even bother, because they have initials after their name. Well, I'm sorry, that's not good enough for us. We're going to test it. And in this video, we will obliterate what this guy is going around teaching as false doctrine. Before we start, though, let's settle one thing. In clarification, even Gordon is not advocating the name Jehovah. Let's be clear. As even he admits, the J is not found in ancient Hebrew. At least he knows that much, or at least he's willing to tell us that much. So those Jehovah's Witnesses seizing on the sky's words as supporting their position and doctrine of Jehovah being the true name of God, sorry, that's inaccurate. You can't use this guy's words for that either. He never says that. He says the name is Jehovah, which we'll prove is also very wrong. Now, we tried to upload a video where we actually played Nehemiah Gordon's actual words. That's the right thing to do, right? Then we responded in commentary, which is our legal right 
protected by the Fair Use Act, in which somehow Dr. Michael Root was able to trample the law. He was able to completely bypass YouTube's claim system even, as well as subvert the Fair Use Act, which allows us such use for commentary legally, and there is no way that Dr. Michael Rood could force us to take this down without taking us to court first. This is not considered copyright material because you're putting international stuff out there which we have the right to review. And to take that right away is evil. Sorry, that's what it is. Now you know just how weak a position is when one has to legislate or even bypass the legal system and force it down one's throat because they cannot actually debate on the matter. Believe me, these two guys cannot because they are not even applying ancient Hebrew and they know it. They are applying modern Yiddish, which is infused with Hebrew elements in modern times. But most certainly, it is not ancient Hebrew. He will never be able to support some of his assertions, such as a V existing in ancient Hebrew. There is not one. How do we know? Well, the Bet Vet is the same letter, and the difference is the dot in the center, right? We'll keep this in simple language. So, look at all the ancient scrolls, and guess what? There is no dot ever. Therefore, there's no differentiation between a B and a V. Therefore, it's always a B. There is no V in ancient Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, Latin, Old French, Old German, nor Old English. In other words, any of the languages that this has gone through. So it's a ridiculous assertion, and you are applying a new language to an old language. And it's backwards reasoning. They add new letters and new rules, not in existence in ancient text. You will find this nowhere. Now, in addition, we're going to address something very quickly. Nehemiah Gordon claims to have amassed a thousand scrolls that render the name of God as Yehovah. Wow. Well, that sounds impressive until you actually look into his video and realize he even admits there. Most all of them are from the 1800s. That is moot. That is immaterial. And we know it would be wrong anyway, because in order for Yehovah to be rendered in ancient Hebrew, you would need vowel points, which is exactly what he's saying. Yet vowel points weren't even placed until the Masoretes. 1000 AD, and he does have a couple of manuscripts from that time. But again, that's fraudulent to claim that he's amassed ancient manuscripts. None of those are ancient. In this conversation, ancient would be the Dead Sea Scrolls, none of which have either a V for Wah nor a V for Bet Bet. It does not exist in any ancient text, period. So, his 1000 AD couple of manuscripts, it's probably the same one he's counting more than once, and then in the 1800s, you've got to be kidding me. So, now let's move to just truly obliterate this. We'll leave a link in the description box. We encourage you to go ahead and watch his video and his actual words. We would prefer to play them, but obviously they just won't allow but that's okay. They were not able to take this video down and keep it down because we're back. So, we're going to be responding to his words. So, please, by all means, review his words. And then watch our testing in which they will fail indeed. Okay, first, one thing is very obvious here. If you don't agree with this guy, remember what Dr. Rood said with a straight face even in the beginning. He'll laugh and scoff at you. Nah, I'm smarter than you. Ah, okay. We'll see what you think at the end of this video. 
fi- funny because Michael Rood didn't even agree with this guy his entire ministry until now, as he always used Yahweh. So maybe he should be laughed at and scoffed at as well. And we'd say, no, no one should, frankly. Indeed, he is smart, and he knows Hebrew well. But what he's doing is he is applying, and we'll show you throughout, Yiddish rules in place of ancient Hebrew. If so, not so smart, unless it's deception, in which case maybe he's even smarter, but in an evil way. And he can win that battle of wits any day, I'm sure. Now, we covered Yiddish, Jiddish, Jewish are the same word, and now it is confirmed by a Pharisee scholar. So it's not just us. Yid is Jid or Jew. All three are synonymous. By default, he is also confirming there is no such thing as Hebrews who called themselves Jews ever. But Ashkenazis from the Russian steppes, which is where Yiddish, Jiddish, Jewish originates. Yiddish is Jewish. The origin of that word as a language And though he gives percentages of how it was infused, he treats Yiddish as a language of Germanic origin, which is ignorance, when even he admits it has Slavic, Hebrew, and he missed the Greek roots, and it was infused into the German language, not the other way around, Yes, it has a lot of German in it. Yeah, we get that. But that's because German was already there. They were the people that were migrating into that area. So they infused their language into German. And that became known as Jiddish, Yiddish, Jewish. It is a complete mischaracterization to call that a Germanic language. As it is a language brought from the Russian steppes by the Ashkenazi Jews, especially in the case of the influence of the J and even the V, as we proved. Old German, Hebrew, Greek, Latin pronunciations were changed by this infusion with Yiddish. And it is the rules of the Yiddish language applied to Hebrew that he often applies in application. Notice, how he sidesteps the source of the language. What he doesn't bother to mention is that, especially in the case of the J, there was no J in any of the languages in which words like Jehovah, which he admits there's no J in Jehovah, but guess what else? There's no J in the word Jew. So it goes through all of these languages, six languages, They did not have the J until they were infused with Yiddish, and we proved that, especially in Part 5, if you haven't seen that. Notice he says his grandmother was from the Russian steppes, not Israel. The Ashkenazi Jew usually can trace their lineage to the Russian steppes, which, by the way, we have no issue with. Nothing wrong with the Russian steppes, nothing wrong with being Ashkenazi, just something wrong with saying that you are Yahudim, when you are not. That is the distinction. And no further does this lineage go back. In most cases, in fact, most Ashkenazis would tell you the same exact story. And the few that claim they go further are talking of their Pharisee lineage or perhaps lying. In part five, testing the origin of the word Jew we prove there was no J until the Renaissance in Hebrew. And the V, because we started to jump into the V even at that point, was a vowel in Latin up until the Renaissance as well, and not a consonant. And it was pronounced with a U, sound. Now that is very important. We touched on the V, 
also being introduced, but now we will go further into the V in history. We had proved that ancient Latin had a V letter, but in time, the time of Julius Caesar especially, yes, we're talking basically biblical times, it was pronounced with a U sound. Here's an example. Gaius Iurius Caesar. Gaius Iurius Caesar. Julius Caesar. Gaius Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar. See, the V is pronounced U, not V, according to historic precedents in ancient Latin. So the V did not come from Latin, and Bible translations, it is inappropriate to assume so. So going backwards in the transliteration process, we've started with Latin, and then we have Greek, and the origin being Hebrew. Again, we remind you, the Greeks originally did not translate the name Yahuwah, the Y-H-W-H, but instead... They merely rendered it in Paleo-Hebrew in the Greek Septuagint, not translating it at all. They wrote it as it was. No changes. Again, this was the practice as we proved during biblical times. And remember, we covered that Latin originated from Greek, and Greek really comes from Hebrew slash Phoenician. So these three languages are connected, but let's go back. Let's look at the neighboring languages to Paleo or ancient Hebrew. How do they treat this similar letter, Wa, in each language? Well, they all render it Wa, the same in ancient times. Not Vav. Not one of them. You'll hear Nehemiah ignore that and only mention the Syriac and diminish it as if it was unimportant, just not connected, and that doesn't mean anything. But it's not just one neighbor. It's basically all of them in ancient times. Yes, this reference calls it a vav in Hebrew now. But that's modern, not ancient Hebrew. And this is a look at the neighbors. It's not just one language, nor a stretch. Phoenician, wow. Aramaic, wow. Syriac, wow. And Arabic, wow. And the Hebrew chart, we keep showing you, and pretty much all we have found for Paleo-Hebrew, say the letter was in ancient times, wow, wow. So, it was not Vav, and it's W or U or O, but not V. That's out in ancient times. And most especially not OV, which Nehemiah's explanation would require, which is really against precedence as well. Read further. It represents the consonant W. So, in all these languages, it's a W in original Hebrew or Paleo-Hebrew. So, this reference says it was a W in Paleo-Hebrew. And they're saying it's a Vav because that's modern, but it was a Wa, just as it is in those other languages. And V in modern Hebrew, so they're telling us. A dot embedded left of or topping the Vav indicates voweling. U or O respectively. So how would they differentiate this in ancient Hebrew when it did not have pronunciation marks and vowel markings at all? When did vowel points begin? Not until around 1000 AD, the days of the Masoretes, as we have shown you. They added such to scripture, and they were Pharisees. The Pharisees created vowel points and such marks, not the lost tribes. 
Look at the Dead Sea Scrolls of Isaiah, and even the other writings of the Dead Sea Scrolls in the era of Messiah, even, and a little after. Look at any of those texts. Do you find punctuation marks and vowel points? No. In Bible times, these did not exist, as they were unnecessary. As the Bible never needed vowels, because the vowels are already within the nature of the consonants, which include vowel sounds, such as the hey, which is A-H, ah, ah, never I, by the way. So it's ya, not y. As we have well established many times over, and nothing in this interview will disprove this, you'll see. We'll show you where this guy actually comes out and then admits what we just told you. Now, notice what he did here. He's saying Hebrew had a V sound in bet or vet. And then he's dragging that over to say that means that the wa has a V. It's a V. Uh, what? That's nonsense. Okay. We'll let him have, logically, the bet vet thing for now. We'll let it go for the moment. But he doesn't prove that either, as that also requires punctuation marks to differentiate the two bet from vet, basically which was not used in biblical times up until 1000 AD, unless, again, the Pharisees were using it prior, which is likely. But that still would not prove that you pronounce wa, a different letter, as a V, ever, in ancient Hebrew. So how do we know how to pronounce things in Hebrew? Well, most of us don't need to speak Hebrew, I know, scoff, scoff, but to pronounce the important words, like, you know, the name of God, really matters. Basically, what he is saying is every language chart for Paleo-Hebrew that we have reviewed is wrong, pretty much, as well as most of his scholars, his colleague scholars. At Hebrew University, even, for that matter, who do not agree with him, nor does the university wide, as they say, Yahweh, not Yahovah. Don't worry, we are going to show you an example, and notice, he doesn't really show many actual examples, does he? He's just talking. Nor does he source them very well, so they're harder to research and prove out. We know this because we're trying to do that, and he does not make it easy. He says a lot and sounds intelligent, but that is what Pharisees do. But what is he really saying? Not much, actually. Take this test for whether or not Moses, when he wrote wa, that he meant v, by, here you go, here's the scientific test we're going to go around and we're going to ask Jews in the 1800s how they pronounce it. Really? Well, I guess that proves it, huh? Isn't that what Jews who never prove they even have roots to the tribes of Israel in the first place would say? Certainly. Those who history bears out are Pharisees, as Judaism is Phariseeism, it is the same. There is no difference other than temple practices. A needed adjustment since the temple is no longer there since 70 AD. Now, they come from Samaria as the replacements of the tribes of Israel and ultimately Persia. Thus, the name Pharisee, Parsi, actually pronounced Farsi, which is a Persian in context. Of course, and no more. The ones who change the language to theirs, not just Yiddish, Yiddish, Jewish, but 
its origin in the Russian steppes, and someone contacting us from the Russian steppes even said that their Slavic language also did not have a J sound in ancient times because it was infused with an incoming migration of people as well. Where would that have come from? Well, highly likely from their origin, which is not Israel, it's not even Samaria, although they went from Persia, their origin, to Samaria, then they came down and conquered Israel, and then they were forced out by the Romans because they rebelled twice with their military, not the Lost Tribe military. So, Pharisee, Parsi means Persian, and yes, in Greek, it means separate. And that's true, because even though they lived among the southern tribes of Israel for a while, and everywhere they go, pretty much, this is the pattern you will see. They still live separate. They lived in things, in Germany especially, things like ghettos. They were called ghettos. That's where the term originates. Go look up the ghetto of the Rothschilds. I'm sorry, the Bowers, because that's their real name, their original name. And you'll find it doesn't look like the African American or any other ethnicity that you want to apply ghettos that we hear about so much today. No. He has no evidence of a precedence as of yet in Paleo-Hebrew in which the name of God comes from, does he? So, no going around and asking Jews in the 1800s how Moses pronounced something almost 3,000 years earlier is not remotely scientific, nor even fruitful, nor should it be paid attention to at all. It's a sham. But he does have more, so let's hear him out fully. The Jews of Syria, who are they? Well, they're Pharisees first, not lost tribes. Who taught them to read the Torah? The lost tribes? No. The rabbis, or Pharisees. They are practicing Judaism, not the biblical relationship laid out in the Bible, which Judaism stands against, according to Messiah. And Judaism is Phariseeism. So, it is a surprise that some may retain their Pharisee original pronunciations which are not recorded in history as sounds in ancient Hebrew, especially for the Wah? No surprise. Did he actually find the origin of this manipulation? Well, perhaps. At least the Pharisees, yes. Certainly the origin. His point that Arabic is the root of the wa, we already showed you, has no actual basis and needs to be articulated far further than that to make a point, which he does not do. Because I say so, we're supposed to accept that? No. As other languages in that area have the wa, or wow, however you pronounce it, doesn't matter, including Aramaic, Phoenician and Syriac, especially, which he already admitted, and the Syriac part anyway, and no, now he ignores a few sentences later. That's odd. All of these seem to come from a root language, which would obviously have a wa, or wow, not vav. And as we have shown you, the Book of Jubilees records what that language was. It was Hebrew, the original Hebrew, the language of creation, used up until the Tower of Babel, and then disappears for a bit and was revived in the days of Abraham. First, that does not make either of these languages the origin of Hebrew, but the other way around, according to Scripture. Hebrew is the origin, and since these other related languages of the same source come later, really, they derive the same letter, wa, 
from that ancient source, ancient Hebrew. Not modern Hebrew infused with Yiddish, Jiddish, Jewish. Not at all. Therefore, ancient Hebrew as recorded in history and the precedence of Scripture is a wa, not a vav. So no, it's not a v. No scholar can prove otherwise, by the way, as they think in a false paradigm as they reject even reading Jubilees especially most of the time. And oh, one of the top people in the world when it comes to the Hebrew language said, wow, that sounds like somebody really important. Uh, or should I say, wah, <laughs> right? What, what, what was his name? And he didn't share that, did he? Are you trying to prove or just talk here? Sounds like just talk, doesn't it? This guy did not prove that that gentleman, whatever his name was, has no agenda, though he claims, oh, see, he could have no agenda. Well, why not? <laughs> I, I, we don't know. We don't even know who he is. How do we know he hasn't been yelling on the street corner that the name of God is Yehovah for all of his life? I mean, it, we don't know because you don't tell us those things. You give us nothing by which to test your claim, which is on purpose. You see this with this guy throughout this interview and everything else that he has pretty much done that we've seen. He's not proving. He's telling. He's telling you which is many times the framework of the scholarly behavior. And it's objectionable. As it does not prove, it demands you accept their findings as if they are gods, almost. Here's the thing. The fact that five Jewish communities still use wa and not vav, and w or u is a sound, and not V, is actually evidence to the contrary. He's trying to use it to support. It doesn't support his case. As we know, the Jews, the Pharisees, have changed the language. Just look at modern Hebrew compared to Paleo-Hebrew, and it's very obvious it's been altered greatly. Much has been added, thus Pharisee leaven. Jewry is solely controlled by Pharisees since the days of just after the Second Temple. When they eliminated the Sadducees, the Essenes or Gnostics disappeared in infiltrating believers and lost tribes and followers of Messiah were hunted by those Pharisees, according to Paul, Luke, and others. There were only Pharisees left, and they began changing the word, doctrines, everything including the language, and they hid the name of God. Yes, that's where this guy comes from, the Pharisees. So, the fact that five sects of modern Jewry still retain the Wah is very telling and evidence this guy is wrong. Again, if all these other charts and references showed Wah was Vav and V, not W or U, then his point might possibly make sense. But the documentation is there, and he would have to overturn it. And he does not, at least not so far. By the way, Hebrew University teaches Yahweh, not Yahovah, so even many of his peers do not agree with him. But he said he has ancient sources. We're intrigued. Let's see what he's got. I mean, so far, he has produced zero proof that Wa is pronounced V in ancient Hebrew. He's really just kind of talking around, and hopefully by the end, he puts on enough of a show that you say, oh, well, maybe that's true. And that's all he wants is just a maybe. That's really all he needs, because deception accomplished must be something from the 1600s B.C., right? The time of Moses. Well, so far he hasn't gone beyond the past 200 years, but let's give him a chance. 
And then the classic scholarly in your face, you don't know, only I do. All Jews agree. Well, there you have it. Let's just stop this video right now. It's proven. All Jews agree. That's it. You know what most Jews agree? That the pronunciation of the name of God is Yahweh. And they don't pronounce it. But they at least agree that it is Yahweh. Now, we don't even support that. But that's not Yehovah, is it? Nope. All Jews do not agree the V was in ancient Hebrew, not even his peers. We're getting to that, and we will show you a sample. However, that statement is meaningless anyway, as Jews are not tribes of Israel, and even if the bet can be vet, so the B, V, though there were no punctuation marks to indicate such, it does not prove still that the Wa is Vav, or V. He says they scoured the sources, and all he comes up with is a poet who does not rhyme a line in conjecture and speculation, which others, scholars, poets, experts agree he doesn't on purpose, but he says that cannot be the case. Well, because he said so. See, he said so. So forget the guy, you know, the, the, the Jewish poet. He doesn't know what he's talking about, of course. It must rhyme. Yet poetry does not necessarily always follow such a rule. Maybe that's Yiddish, too. Or maybe he's just making up his own rules of poetry, perhaps. So, he can't even prove his point and does not have agreement. And that is supposedly to be accepted as fact. I mean, it's established now. I mean, he's, he's closing the book. It's established. Nope, it's not. Now, there was a poet named Kalir in the 6th century BC, correct. But he did not live in Jerusalem, nor Judea. He lived in Samaria. So let's get that straight. And he was a Pharisee, liturgical poet as well. There was no Israel in terms of country there at that point, period. So he was not from Israel. That is not true. And the northern kingdom never returned because the Persians, Assyrians, Pharisees already replaced them there. And yes, the Bible says so, and we cover that in our Lost Tribes series, and we prove it from Scripture. It's there. See, he frames it as if Israel continued in the northern kingdom. It did not. And it was Samaritans, Pharisees, who lived there attempting to infuse their religion of Ashima Hashem with Yahuwah, which he rejected then. Messiah rejected and he still rejects that religion called Judaism today, called Phariseeism in the time of Messiah, who overwhelmingly rejects it as against the commandments of Yahuwah. All the lost tribes were removed from both the northern and southern kingdoms, and neither have returned yet according to scripture, and we prove that too, unless some OFWs happen to be lost tribes, in fact, which we prove our in our Lost Tribes series. Okay, so this poet, according to experts near that era, did not rhyme, and he dismisses valid criticism from an expert poet closer to that era regarding the rhyme, but look at the two words from Strong's Concordance. And remember, there were no vowel points or punctuation marks, none, in ancient Hebrew. Look at the Dead Sea Scrolls. They do not have them. So, no distinguishing mark to tell us which is a vet or bet. But he tells us it's a soft bet, right? That it's a V. But he doesn't prove that. 
He assumes that. Because, you know, we all know, whenever you hear that, we all know. Uh, what do we know? And who knows it? And where did that come from, right? Because that is a classic line of someone who deceives. Nabi, or he says Navi, as it is pronounced in modern Hebrew, and we agree that's modern Hebrew, he got it right. In ancient Hebrew, no. He doesn't prove it's a V, as he does not show us a soft bet or vet, really, in any instance. He doesn't show us the punctuation marks and vowel points, for that matter, existed in the Dead Sea Scrolls and in writings in biblical times. No, no. You know why? Because he can't. He even has another claim of a thousand manuscripts he's been collecting all this time. He started with like 200, and then, you know, he keeps getting, oh, he's got all these manuscripts that render the name of God as Yehovah. But see, here's the problem. They have vowel points, meaning they are likely from the era of 1000 AD and after, long after the Bible was written and the days of Paleo-Hebrew, which the Pharisees replaced. We're just supposed to accept it. This because he says so. Where's the poem? What's it even called? He doesn't mention that, does he? This guy wrote hundreds of poems. I mean, every festival, every feast day, he's writing poems every year for many years. So which one? Which one is it? Well, he doesn't want you to check it out. He doesn't want you to test this. Regardless, la oui et <coughs> nabi are the same in meter and very appropriate to use in a poem because it doesn't have to rhyme. The meter has to be there and they sound similar. It is not inappropriate in poetry whatsoever. Ever. There is no point here to use that obscure poem from the 6th century to say the Jews of that period, which again are not Hebrews anyway, but Samaritans, returning to their homeland in Samaria in this case, which is where this guy lived. He lived around Mount Carmel, in fact. The same sect who wrote the Samaritan Pentateuch, in fact. And they were Samaritans, not Hebrews. Let's be clear. But even so, to say it is now settled fact, as he does, and without question, based on that, is just fraud. Because you didn't prove anything. And yet you move to the, I proved it, it's done, over, that's it. But you didn't prove it. You haven't proven it. You're just throwing things out there. And none of them stick. Even Jews do not believe your assumption, especially the very Ibn Ezra, the liturgical poet. So an expert in this guy's field, and you quote, saying that the poet of the 6th century was, your words, stupid? And then you dismiss him as just not knowing Hebrew? Yet he is almost a thousand years closer to the matter, and in the same field, and you are not, well, it wouldn't matter because the synagogue of Satan is not the lost tribes who are the original Hebrew-speaking people, not Jews. The poetry, it is clearly not rare to see a poem employ other methods that don't necessarily always rhyme. And certainly they sometimes will rhyme, 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 and then alternate with something of the same meter. You see that often, with a similar sounding word of the same meter. Nabi, yes, Nabi, as he doesn't prove it was a V either, and Lawi, Nabi, Lawi, Nabi, Lawi, Nabi, Lawi, are close in sound. And no, they do not ruin the flow of the poem at all. That's a non-point. Wow. Oh, yeah. And then you have Ibn Ezra, whom he says, 
spoke Arabic, which, yes, Ibn Ezra studied Arabic, but what he left out, Ibn Ezra was a Spanish Jew, not an Arab. No, he was a Jew living in Spain, but again, not an Arab. You mean to tell me he didn't learn from his synagogue how to pronounce at least a few of the big Hebrew words like that of the Levites? Really? His parents never taught him the 12 tribes of Israel and how to say their names, especially the priestly order of all things? The assumption's really ludicrous, and deceptively, it leaves out vital information, which really just discounts it. Sure, he seems to make sense, but he is disproving himself. When you research what he says, which he makes as difficult for you as possible, because you can't find all of his references, so how would one know? He didn't make them up, just to make a point in some cases. See, he can get away with that. Actually, he can't hear, but among many people, because he's the expert, he's the scholar, so people believe everything he says. They don't require him to prove, and we never, ever should have allowed that paradigm to exist, because deception will always come out of that. Perhaps he didn't, and we aren't saying he did, but the point is, what are we doing here? We are to prove all things. And this is the exact kind of doublespeak that gives one a headache in attempting to confirm. Here's an example of another Hebrew University scholar who responds to this pastor's question seeking clarification on the name Jehovah, or Yahovah, specifically, though, regarding the V, he's going to weigh in, and wow, this is good. Hey, this is Pastor Randy. I'd like to welcome you to Drive-By Teaching. Well, today I want to talk about a correspondence that I received from a professor of Fassberg from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Now, before that, I want to give you a little bit of history as to what led up to this correspondence. Where I sent several emails, and this is really focused, by the way, on the name Yehovah and whether or not this has any historical and scholarly evidence and support. So to confirm this, I sent about 20 emails out to different professors from Harvard and also from Stanford and also from the Hebrew University of, of Jerusalem. Now, every professor I sent this to had a background either in linguistics or Hebrew studies. Now, I received one response from Stanford. I also received three responses from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. What was really amazing though, is that two of the professors who responded from the Hebrew University pointed me to a professor, Stephen Fassberg, and Fassberg himself also responded. Now, I wanna give you a sense of, of uh, who this man is, is Professor Fassberg. So let me give you some of his credentials. Number one, he received his PhD from Harvard. He's one of the leading professors in the, the Hebrew, uh, at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem within the Hebrew language department. He's also a member of the Academy of the Hebrew Language, Jerusalem. He's an associate editor for the Historical Dictionary of the Hebrew Language Project. He's an associate editor for the Encyclopedia of Hebrew Language and Linguistics. He was the chair of the Department of Hebrew Language between 1998 and 2001, and also between 2006 and 2009 where he was also the director of the Orion Center for the study of the Dead Sea Scrolls and associate literature between 2006 and 2009. Now, according to Wikipedia, I want to give you a sense of, of the Orion Center because it's a big deal. The Orion Center was established in 1995 as part of the Institute for the Jewish Studies at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Its overarching aim is to stimulate all aspects of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, in addition to uh, Professor Fassberg's uh, credentials. He's also contributed many, many sources. I want to give you just a few. You go online, by the way, you can look at these sources, look at his profile in the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. You're going to be blown away at this man's profile and this man's credentials. But let me give you just, a, again, a feel of who this man is. So he's contributed, for instance, to the Journal of Semitic Studies Supplement, the Jewish Study Bible, the Encyclopedia Judaica, the, the Judaica, think about that, the Judaica, major, major source 
within the uh, Jewish world. The uh, New Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible, the Encyclopedia of Hebrew Language and Linguistics. So this man's credentials, again, are just spectacular. They're remarkable. So this is a person we should really pay attention to. So I want to read now my message to him and along with many, many other professors. But again, he was really the only one who responded to give a full description of, of to my inquiry. So here's what I said. I am in the process of beginning of researching the Hebrew Tetragrammaton and have noticed some using the form Yehovah. Can you confirm whether Yehovah is proper or correct based on Hebrew letters yod he wal he or Y-H-W-H? Also, can you confirm the origins of the Hebrew letter Vav and the V sound within the Hebrew language? Is this letter and sound found in ancient Hebrew or later? And does it predate the Hebrew Wow? Several sources state that the V sound was influenced from the Germanic language and was not present in Biblical Hebrew, Koine Greek, or Phoenician. Does scholarship confirm this conclusion? So here's his response. And I want you to listen again. Keep in mind this man's credentials, who he is, what he's done, what he's accomplished. So here's his response. He says, the pronunciation you mentioned is a mistake. So number one, he says here right off the bat that the term Yehovah is a mistake. He says a Hebrew consonal text is Y-H-W-H. -H, and no one really knows how that was pronounced in Old Testament times. At a later date, the latter half of the second millennium CE, Masaris added vowel signs to the consonal text. Whenever the Tetragrammaton was written, they added the vowel signs of the word Adonai, which means my Lord. There was a taboo on pronouncing the divine name and one was supposed to read the word Adonai, my Lord. Much later, now pay attention to this. This is such an important part of his correspondence. This is much later, some started reading the vowel signs together with YHWH and came up with the nonsensical word Jehovah. And we could easily say Jehovah there. Goes on to say there is no doubt that the original sound was W and not a V. Sometime during the history of the Roman or the history of the Hebrew language, there was a shift from W to V in pronunciation, probably already during the Moschniak period. While he doesn't support Professor Fassberg here, the uh, name Yahweh, as, as we believe here, and as most scholars do confirm. Notice what he says about this word, Yehovah. He confirms that it was a mistake. He says here that this word is nonsensical. What is the word, what is the meaning of nonsensical? The meaning of nonsensical is irrational. It doesn't make sense based on rational. When we, when we look at the evidence, there's nothing to confirm this from a scholarship standpoint. And, you know, do your own research, by the way. You can see this beyond Professor Fassberg and what he says. We also confirms here, and I really found this remarkable, he confirms here that the Jews never intended the vowel points from Adonai to be read with the letters yod he wal he or the Y-H-W-H. In other words, again, he says that they were to read Adonai, Adonai, not, not this Yehovah. They, they added these vowel points so they would not read the sacred name or the divine name, as he explains here. We also confirms here that the uh, W predates the V within the Hebrew language. And, and why that's important, by the way, is it shows and it proves that Yehovah is an impossibility based on biblical Hebrew. Now, Pastor Randy is not the most dynamic of speakers in drive-by teaching. I guess he loves cars. I don't know. But he asked three Hebrew University scholars about the name Jehovah, and two of the three led him to this Harvard PhD professor Fastberg, because they agree with him, obviously. Now, we don't see this guy as any more credible just because he has letters behind his name, because he is also a Jew who refuses to pronounce the name of God, certainly, and says no one knows but the point is, don't just listen to us. Nehemiah Gordon is not even supported by many of his peers. Even the Hebrew University position on the name of God is Yahweh, not Yehovah. He says there is no V in Hebrew. That's what Professor Fastberg just said. He said no V consonant in Hebrew. 
Now understand what that means because it's not just the wa. Okay? This means wa is not vav in ancient Hebrew, but it also means that there was no vet. It was a bet, but there was not a vet, because those are also consonants. So he said there's no V consonant in the language in ancient Hebrew, period. This actually places us on equal footing, sort of, because his peers have rejected his scholarship as nonsensical. That's their word, not ours. So since this is not actually scholarship, even in the scholarly community, Maybe our opinion does matter here. and Maybe we can prove things even further than this guy does. And we believe we do. Notice what else he says, though. He says there is no V in ancient Hebrew, period. And this would include the vet, modifying bet, which, what they call a soft bet, producing a V. And that's very telling. And that's because there are no punctuation marks in ancient Hebrew, so there's no such differentiation, period. There's no way to overcome that. Nehemia cannot do that. Nehemia covers these things as even they are proven, but even his peers do not agree. So that means he must prove his position, and thus far, he does not. But in all fairness, Let's let Nehemiah finish, because he's not quite done yet. Because maybe, maybe he brings it home in the end. I know, not real promising, but let's see. All right, here we go again. Now he operates on the assumption that he has been proving a case here, which he has proven not one thing. But you can go all the way back to the time of Isaiah, and you find what? Well, you find manuscripts with no vowel points or punctuation marks at all. That's what you find. So, do you really want to go there? Well, let's look at this. Gav, meaning back, can be written with a soft bet or a wa. Uh-oh. Didn't Harvard linguist, Ph.D., and Professor Fastberg just say there was no V consonant in ancient Hebrew? Oops. Again, that does not prove it has to be a V sound regardless, as it would not have punctuation marks to distinguish anyway, as that is modern Hebrew and really Yiddish, in which the base has a sister in Yiddish, the vase, just like bet, vet. You can almost just look at the chart and see the origin of that. The notion that other Hebrew words never and cannot possibly have two spellings is not supported and really a deceptive point. We have shown some in this series even, like the name of Joshua, has two ways to write the name. It's Yahusha and Yahushua. Neither is wrong, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's okay. Of course, it also depends on what manuscript he is talking about, because he could have put it up on screen for you to view, but he does not. He even has his computer right there the whole time, but no, 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 Goyim, no proof for you. It's mine. All mine. Again, that is not evidence that Moses meant Vav, or V, when he wrote down a wa in the name of God. Those kinds of claims have to be backed up, and he does not do so. Now, this guy says a lot, and this is only one interview, we admit, but we will show you one last clip from a different interview, just a short, one that really shows the double-mindedness here that we're dealing with. So, see what you think. Uh, he speaks of hiding God's name as if it is a good thing. And he actually, if you watch all of the interview, he, he's just begging to, to tell people why it was a good thing to hide God's name. Ah, uh, disgusting. 
Absolutely. Yeah, what a holy tradition to bastardize your God's name as your people did before. You know, Baal, which is just Lord in Hebrew. See, when they were in Samaria, where they hid the name of their God also, as they believed, one was never to pronounce it. And that is why we see Baal, even written in Scripture, which is just a title, instead of Molech, Andromelech, or whichever name you wish to assign to that false god, Ashima. That was what they infused Yahuwah into. It's that religion that they tried to force Yahuwah into before they came down and conquered the southern kingdom. No, thank you. You keep your pagan Samaritan practice, as you said yourself, really. Quite telling. So, he admits God's name, though. I mean, did you just hear this? He admits God's name is Yah. Y-A-H. He just spelled it out for us. He said his name is spelled N-E-H-E-M-I-A-H on his birth certificate. And that it means Yah comforts. Well, look at the word on screen. See the Hebrew word for comfort? Yeah. Nahama? Yeah. Nahama, Nahama, yeah. That's actually his name. So, Nehemiah, all right, close. That, that's okay, all right. So he's probably right about that. We'll give, him to, give it to him, except for he puts an E where there's an A, but that's okay. They do that in the Bible as well. No problem. We don't have an issue with those kinds of things. What we have an issue with is the fact that Yah is in his very name. And we agree. It's there. First thing he has really said that makes sense. But there's a massive dilemma here. If the father's name, Yah, Y-A-H, then it's not Yah. Why, E-H, is it? And if one's practice is to hide the name of God, why would he tell you the accurate name which he himself is forbidden to use? In fact, he can't write it properly or pronounce it properly by his own admission because he has to hide it from you, yet we are supposed to believe he will write and pronounce things properly for us goyim. Think of it from Yahuwah's perspective. It's like saying, I love you. I want to marry you. But I can't speak or write your name. We do not suggest you try that on your bride-to-be. Because you will be in the doghouse. If you were his people, you would use his name. Continue his name name in your own name, definitely. Because the name in the Bible for his people is never Jew. That is a horrible transliteration. It's Yahudim. See, Yah, Yahu, is in the name. Who would take that out? Well, you fill in the blanks. Think about the words of Yahusha, in fact. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. And Luke 12 is basically the same parallel. But he adds before the angels of God there. Deny the name of the Father pretty much the same. And we know why they do and where their doctrine comes from. And it certainly is not Torah or Bible. It is not a beautiful practice. It's an evil one to blot out the name of Yahuwah and replace it with the hand of ruin and mischief, or even if you don't believe Strong's definition or the application within the word. The point is, Yahovah or Jehovah is not and cannot 
B, the pronunciation of the name of God. And it's about time people take a stand on these kinds of things. So does any of this matter? I mean, does it matter if you are using the name of the God of destruction intended or not for Yahuwah? Of course folks aren't doing it with intention. We're being deceived. Scripture says it matters to him, and it is clear this is a deception. Is this not a weighty matter? In our age, this is one of the weightiest, and this is why the Pharisees are out there trying to evangelize Christians and Messianics into continuing to use the wrong names. Not just this one, but others, and even Hashem, which we will deal with in another video. Because their aim, even according to Nehemiah, I'm sorry, Nehemiah, <laughs> didn't get the hook in there, huh? uh, is to hide his name. That's what he said, and we know that's truth. No scripture ever supports that doctrine, yet you don't see Dr. Michael Rood demanding that small fact. And he should have stepped in at that point in the interview, especially, one would think. Let's just overlook it and move on. And here, the throaty sound, we are told is Hebrew. But is it? I mean, do we know that it is? Have we made them prove that as well? Yes, we agree. It's modern Hebrew, which has been infused with Yiddish, Jiddish, Jewish. But did the tribes of Israel... Hawk loogies all the time like that? Or did that come from another influence? We're not saying that they didn't. What we're wondering is, can anyone prove that that is accurate? We're not quite sure that it is. We don't know yet, but another topic we are looking into, they take ancient hymns, even from Scripture, and they put them to this music, which has a very distinct sound, with specific chord progressions as well. Very, very interesting. The thing is, if you study the gypsy music originating in the Russian steppes, it seems to match that sound fairly closely. Of course, Nachem did... I get that throaty sound right? <laughs> Nahemia uh, would tell you that's because the Hebrews migrated into the Russian steppes, yet what he cannot do is prove that from Scripture nor history, because Scripture says otherwise, and so does history. And we completely map that out in our Lost Tribe series. In another interview of his, by the way, we see him also saying none of his professors at Hebrew University knew how to even say his name properly. Okay, we're talking about the name of a prophet in Scripture, and they didn't know how to pronounce it? He doesn't even realize, in puffing his own ego, he's actually saying Hebrew University doesn't know how to speak Hebrew. Interesting. No, he did not say it that way, of course, but step back and think about it the ramifications of what he's saying. The thing is, they have been taught, and the origin of jew you and modern Jewry is 100% Pharisee doctrine, as we laid out in the last video. So if you haven't seen part 7, go back and see it. So, we know Messiah rebuked their doctrines as against his commandments, adding their leaven, making the word of none effect. He even comments on their bloodlines, or at least the origin of their doctrines, if you choose not to see it that way, when he says they are of their father the devil. Do they have to be? No. As we have said many times over, even a Jew can be saved, unless for some reason they hail from the Nephilim somehow, which would render them ineligible for heaven. No, 
do not have a list of such, but those bloodlines are out there, and there are some that are preserved within the Ashkenazi ranks, but it's not everyone. So it's not necessarily a Jewish thing even. In closing, let us all seek truth on these matters. They are weighty and they uncover a deception we all better be aware of as we are to know our enemy. We are responsible to guard our hearts and not be deceived. That's on each of us, not pastors or anyone else. Your pastor does not stand before Messiah on the day of judgment with you. You are on your own. And salvation is based on your relationship with him. No one else influences that. Not at that point. We must research these things for ourselves, or we'll never really know them anyway. And yes, we are fully aware Nehemia Gordon's response to us would be to scoff and scoff and laugh this off because, thank Yahuwah, we did not attend Hebrew University. Shoo! Good thing. We'd have a lot to unlearn. If we had, we'd still be years away from getting to the truth, which is fine by us. But no, you are dealing with a Pharisee here, and he is offering leaven. Even many of his colleagues don't agree with so, so much of what he says. So now our view is not only not far-fetched, it's accurate. And his attempt to agitate the issue further by bringing back a completely laughable name, especially with its origins, even admitting in his own name, Yah, is the name of God, not Yah. In fact, haha, you are using a name which originated from placing the vowels of Adonai into YHWH, which is nothing short of unscholarly and rather stupid, really. So, no, we ain't buying. The name of God has been restored as Yahuwah. And nothing this Pharisee has said disproves that. And in his doublespeak, even though he is confident in his confusion, even he confuses things, doesn't he? No, thank you. Even if he had proven there was originally a V sound in the Wah, which he did not, it still does not prove it is accurate to apply it as a V in the name of Yahuwah, which he really doesn't even bother to address, meaning he really proves nothing. One Pharisee poet may or may not have, probably did not, according to another poet nearer his time and his conclusion, it's settled. That's it. This settles it all. This proves it all. Yeah, well, this is what scholarship does. And it is the most ignorant way to apply reason, really. It says this is fact because I say so. Nope, don't ever accept that. That's never good enough for anyone, including us. You will never hear that on this channel, but more so from anyone. Reject that and test it. Prove all things. There are no sacred doctrines, and all sacred doctrines will survive every test, if they're truly sacred. It still isn't fact, because you call it fact. You have to prove it to be fact, and this guy does not. And we are going to be dealing with the full history of the Jews soon, how they migrated into Samaria as replacements, confirmed by history as well, and the Bible, infused their religion with worship of Yahuwah, even as Gordon says, not pronouncing the name of their God, was a Samaritan practice before these times that we're talking about. 
which tells you the actual origin of that doctrine. See, they were already hiding the name of their God before. They're just continuing their same practices from Samaria. That's what you're seeing here. They conquered Judea in the Hasmonean Revolt, which should be titled the Samaritan Conquest, taking over the temple and infusing their priests and religion. They hunted and even killed many believers in Messiah and lost tribes, pushing them out of Judea. Even before, as James, actually Jacob, or Yaakov, Yaakob, says in his time, the twelve tribes were already scattered, and that is before the destruction of the temple, because he died before them. We will be releasing full evidence of this migration which began in Persia, thus Pharisees or Parsis, Farsis, as a name of the sect? We'll get there. But, as we proved before, his name is Yahuwah. That is his name. Thank you for watching the Name of God series. Please share this video with others and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to click the bell and view our website at thegodculture.com. Always remember to prove all things for yourself. Yahuwah God bless.